Hi, my name is Tony Morris. I work at Data61 for the CSIRO. And my team is name is Queensland Functional Programming Lab. We're a team of 10 people, and we write code all day. Would you guess it's in Haskell, most of it? Not always, but most of it. Who's heard of Haskell? Who writes it all day long? Who writes it sometimes? Cool. Who hasn't heard of Haskell? Cool, one brave person, there's more than that. <coughs> Haskell's a programming language. It was developed in uh, the late 90s, 1990s, and uh, it adheres to the functional programming thesis. So I've been asked tonight to do a talk on functional programming. Um, I've made it so that it's um, as very introductory as I possibly can. Um, is that okay? And I've been told that I have about 45 to 60 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the really introductory stuff for about 30 minutes, and then I'm going to ask you guys what you want to talk about next. All right, I've got a few proposals, but because are, are there some people who, who like it, they're all over functional programming? I want to get on with the hard stuff. They're in the room; they just don't put their hand up. So we'll do the, the, the basic stuff. All right. So I'm going to assume you've heard of it. You typed it into Google one day, something happened, and then you just closed the tab. That's what I'm going to assume happened. All right. Is that cool? Everyone cool with that? All right. Does everyone, or has anyone in here not used any programming language ever? That's okay too. Okay, everyone's done that. People who put their hand up and they go, yeah, I do Microsoft Excel. <laughs> I go, yeah, that's a programming language. <coughs> it's just that variable names are like A1, B3, and so on. It's just another programming language. <coughs> it's functional programming language, actually. So, um, the thing about functional programming, um, I first started using it, um, I, I was living here in Brisbane uh, in the early 2000s, I was working for a Java consultancy, um, and uh, I, I, was, I was kind of learning it and filling around with the ideas, and I said to the CEO of the company, you're all doing it wrong. That's, that was my opinion. Um, you know, the CEO pressed me for my opinion, usually I just sit there and be quiet. He said, hey, you know, we should use Spring Framework and Hibernate and XML and all that. I said, no, we should, we should use functional programming. And uh, I kind of, you know, I sat down with him for a couple of hours and explained some things. And then he said, your new job is to sit next to me and teach me functional programming. And I did that for six months. And uh, after those six months, all, you know, all of my but there's about 30 people in the call, 20, 30 people in that company. They, um, they all learned functional programming and uh, they all still do it today. That's how the Brisbane Functional Programming Group started, actually. Um, so we said, hey, it's not just us that should learn this stuff, it's everyone. <coughs> yeah, so. All right, I'm gonna tell you what functional programming means. All right, when, we, when you typed it into Google, you would've got 10 answers. What, what I'd like to do is say, what does it mean? All right, that's going to take you about 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Then there's, why do I care? Who cares? And that takes, well, I've been doing it for like 17 years now. Um, it takes at least 17 years to answer. All right, but I don't, I've not got to the bottom of that answer. And um, there's good reasons, I just, I can't, I don't think I know all of them. All right, so I'm going to tell you what it means. All right. <coughs> That's the Queensland Functional Programming Lab under the CSIRO. Um, we're in the Fortitude Valley. Um, if you leave here tonight and you're like, yep, I want to learn functional programming, what do I do? The answer is come and knock on my door. <laughs> we're in the valley. We'll sit you down at the desk. I'll, I'll, I'll teach it to you. I'll help you. Whatever project you're working on, whatever. Um, I find it interesting that your government wants you to do functional programming. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Your whole government wants you to do functional programming. Hmm. I, I think it's more like I do. So just a bit of a background. Um, I used to work on the, for, um, the Java development kit, um, JDK. Um, do you guys still use that these days? Like, I, I, I don't keep a finger on the industry. <coughs> enough. A lot of people were using it 10 years ago anyway. Um, I, this company doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was bought out by Oracle. Um, but I was working for IBM, and uh, 
you know, like, this is like, how do they even get into functional programming? Um, because back then there was no one doing it. Um, if you walk down the street and say functional programming, you get arrested or something. I, I don't know. I never tried it. <laughs> yes. um, there was nobody. And uh, I was, you know, I was doing these things that you know everyone in here, I'm sure, is like, you know, you want to do better at your code and do better at your job and make your software work better and so on. <clears throat> Surely someone better, smarter than me, has figured this stuff out. You know, I was hitting up against bugs. I actually used to work on. Um, have you heard of Java Swing? Or am I showing my page? Java Swing. Okay, Java. Yeah, for those who don't know, it was, it was like a. Um, user interface framework or library written in Java. And it was one of these programs included in the IBM JDK. And uh, I was on L3 support for this thing. And it just crashed all the time. And, oh man, it was just terrible. Surely someone smarter than me has figured out how to solve these problems. You know, here I am doing the object oriented and swing this and that, trying to fix up all these bugs. Surely there's a better way. And it, you know, I, I hit up against some walls, it's like, no, not that, not that. What is it? It turns out it's called functional programming. And that's when I realized that this is how I overcome all of these problems that I was encountering in software engineering. Smarter people have figured it out. They just figured it out in the 1930s. I didn't get the memo. <clears throat> so what does it mean? All right, so this is just some code. It's written in any programming language, whatever you want to call it. And we look at this, this uh, procedure here called Wibble. It takes A, B, updates counter. <coughs> counter is off, off somewhere. We don't know where counter is. Then it returns A plus B times 2. Then there's a million lines of code there. And then there's this expression. All right, that's the million and first line of code right there. And we look at these two expressions and we say they're the same expression. Right? Who said don't repeat yourself? DRY, dry. Don't repeat yourself. I just call that functional program. But other people call it DRY. Don't repeat yourself. So, we refactor our code, we pull that expression out there, and we assign it to a value R. And then I substitute R where the expression was. And now the expression is not repeated. It occurs once, not twice. <coughs> Did the program just change? Who thinks the program just changed? It's okay to be wrong, that's fine. <laughs> um, I, I am wrong about this quite often when I have to read that kind of code. And who thinks it didn't change? It's the same program. Same program. Few, few people, well, I think it was most people think it changed. It changed because of that. It changed because this occurs now only once. Oops. Whereas in back in this example, it occurs twice. Count got updated twice in the previous. I refactored my code to this, and now the counter only updates once. It's a different value for the counter. I cannot naively go into the expression, factor it out, and just substitute it. It'll change the program. Right? I'll get an array index out of bounds, error, or whatever I'm going to get, because I've just updated the counter. Can you sympathize with the problem that I'm getting at here? In that in order to know how, whether or not I refactor this code, I have to do a whole program analysis. I have to get the whole program, get it in my head, not make any mistakes, and then refactor it. That's a big job. I can't do it. Can you hold a million lines of code in your head? I can't do it. All the variables doing this and that. I cannot do it. <clears throat> and here's a counter example. So this time there's no counter updating, it takes A and B, does A plus B and multiplies by 2. <coughs> Million lines of code, and then we see that. Don't repeat yourself. Factor it out. Did the program just change? Who says it just changed? Ooh. 
half, half is okay. It's like, mm, maybe. That's because you were all born functional programmers. <coughs> it didn't change. That's the same program. All right, there's no updating a counter. What do we mean by the same program? What we mean is, for given inputs, we always get the same outputs. We may get different, different complexity. It might run longer or slower or something like that. But it's the same program. I can substitute that expression with the value, and the program will not change. OK? Does that make sense so far? If not, please say so. The reason is that is a function. That's it. That's a function. Imagine if everything was a function. Wouldn't that be good? It's the same program. You might hear this term, referential transparency. <coughs> and that is to say, we can substitute that expression with the value without changing the program. We say referentially transparent, that expression. I've also seen this um, worded differently. Like if you see things like um, make your objects immutable or something, you know, these kinds of things, what they're trying to do is say, make it so the expressions that use those objects are referentially transparent. It's just a fancy way you can say it at the coffee shop tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Well, you know variables, just none of those. <clears throat> There's some consequences. If I said to you, right, that's it, all our expressions will always be referentially transparent. Right, we just put a stake in the ground and we said, I'm just never going to break this rule. Can you think of some consequences? I'll show you a couple. There's none of this anymore. Alright, you can't have objects with fields that update, with like bar update, or you know, however it is in your language. You can't have these variables. You can't even do that. You can't even do that. I equals zero. You know what happens when I say I equals zero? I will damn well equal zero. <laughs> What the hell is that? <laughs> right? I'm going to go onto all your eyes and put zero. That's exactly what I'm going to do. That's, I'm going to go straight into that body of that loop and I'm going to go zero, 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 and all the eyes. And you're going to go, yeah, same program. Well, it's not, is it? <clears throat> what about, this is a common question, how do we read files? Right? Can I substitute that expression there? There's the same expression, that read file, read file. How do I read files? This is, this, is, this is not an easy question for me to answer, I think. Um, who's done the data 61 FP course, by the way? Okay. And, and you might remember right at the end on day three is when we finally read a file. Right? Remember that? Like it, took, it took us three days to get up to let's read a file. Before that, we were doing other things. It's <coughs> not an easy question to answer. So, you know, if I said to you, add up numbers in a list, here's a list of numbers, add them all up, and you know how to do Y plus plus, and then we lose, what are we going to do? Someone's going to say to you, tomorrow you'll be standing in the line at the coffee shop. Someone will go, you can't add up numbers if you do functional programming, because so they'll think that you have to have a loop. We can't read files. Or, you know, these are the kinds of questions that we now have to ask, because we've just put that stake in the ground. All right. So the definition of functional programming is really truly trivial. It is simply, we're always using functions. We are always referentially transparent. We never break this rule. But there's some consequences. Because if I, if I take all those tools away that you're familiar with in like Python or Java or whatever it is you use, you can't even add up numbers in a list. That's your familiar tool. It's a for loop, right? <coughs> That's the hard bit. The definition is not the hard bit. It's the consequences. Okay. 
So does everyone feel confident they now know what functional programming means? Or is, is there anyone who doesn't? Be brave. Okay. Everyone in this room now knows what it means. We always use functions. All our expressions are referentially transparent at all times. And for those of you who have not heard of Haskell, Haskell is a programming language where that rule is enforced. And that's why I use it for teaching. So if I, if I use it for teaching and I say, hey, add up numbers in a list, it's either not going to compile or you did it without breaking the rule. You, I, don't even, I don't even have to get into an argument. It's really good for me. It's not good for you because you're like, oh, how do I do it? How do I add up the numbers in a list or whatever? <coughs> I'll help you through it, of course. But you ultimately have to argue with the compiler. It means the other people on my team, the nine other people, when they write some code, I know that they've adhered to that rule before I even open up the source file. They must have. It's Haskell. <coughs> All right? Does that make sense? All expressions are referentially transparent in Haskell. You might have heard of some languages where they, like, they compromise on this rule. They go, oh, sometimes they're referentially transparent. We kind of, we put a backdoor in there so that you can kind of cheat. Um, I'm not a fan. It means that I have to now do a whole program analysis to see where all the cheat codes are. It's a lot of, a lot of time. So how do we do our data structures? How do we, uh, you know, if you can't have a person with an updated name and an address, whatever, what do we do? How do we even write loops? How do I, I don't know, what do you use loops for often yet? <laughs> um, add up numbers in a list. What are they for again? Counting things. How do we read and write files? I honestly have forgotten. Um, <coughs> I mean, I've written a lot of loops. Don't get me wrong. It's back somewhere in my revision history. In like the early 2000s. <coughs> oh, here we go. How, how do we add up numbers in a list? <coughs> like this, right? Isn't that how you add up the numbers in a list? I'll never forget, a good, very good friend of mine once said to me, you have to have for loops. There's no other way you can write programs without for loops. This was a very long, long time ago. I said, hang on, wait up there. What's really going on is, I don't know how else to solve these problems except without a loop. Uh, my job now is to transfer a new tool or a new skill. How do we solve this problem? Because there we are breaking the rule, there we are like r equals zero. You know what's going to happen if you ever say any r equals zero, right? I'm going to go, well, zero equals zero plus a list i, doesn't it? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put zero right there and there. <clears throat> and it's not going to compile. Okay, good, it doesn't compile. All right. So here's another way of looking at it. Let's talk about like this very trivial problem. Because you know, really we don't I don't add up numbers in this all day long. But let's just talk about this trivial, simple consequence. We, we don't even know how to add up the numbers in the list. I'm going to give you the definition of the sum of the list. If the list is zero, oh, sorry, if the list is empty, then return zero. Otherwise, it's the first element plus the sum of the rest. Everyone agree that's the definition of the sum of the list? So you give me a list of numbers, here they are, and they go, well, is the list empty? It's no, nope. well, it's the first one plus the sum of the rest. But it's a recursive definition. There, here I am saying the definition of a sum is sum. I'm referring to sum in the definition. It's like looking up the dictionary and saying, you know, what is a penguin? Well, a penguin is like a penguin. It doesn't tell you anything. But I want you to convince yourself that this kind of recursive definition converges. It will always get to, it will always get to that zero case. <coughs> it'll go the first element, sum of the rest, and it'll keep going until the, the list is exhausted and it'll return zero. So here's a list, six, five, nine, seven, one, three. The definition for sum is, <coughs> is that list empty? No. Well, it's the first element plus the sum of the rest. 
And then the sum of the rest is defined as the first element plus the sum of the rest. And the sum of that is defined as the first element plus the sum of the rest. And so on. Until we get to the sum of the empty list, there's nothing left. And the sum of the empty list we know is zero. So I get 94. Does that make sense? No loops? I didn't need to do O plus plus. Do you ever wash the dishes? And you do this, so there's like a stack of dishes there. And you go, <coughs> Var r equals zero. <laughs> then you get what's the dish? Okay, r equals r plus one. You don't do that. You go, are there any more dishes left? Yes. Wash. Repeat. You don't like the little counter to the side and put tokens in there. <clears throat> um, quite, quite a while ago, I haven't heard it in a while, but people used to say to me quite regularly that Functional programming is counterintuitive. That it's like, um, it's not easy to understand. Four loops are much easier to understand. Um, and I, I, I could show you the video, I wasn't planning on showing the video, but I do have a video of um, my son. I have two children, they're both 18 and 16 now. But when my youngest son was nine, I, he'd been writing Haskell for like three years. And I introduced him to the idea of I++. Like, and I recorded it. And uh, I mean, I, I, I won't give you any spoilers in case I do play it for you, but you can kind of guess what might happen. <coughs> for me, at that moment, I was convinced that that argument is wrong. It's not. Functional programming is not counterintuitive. It's the other way around. Try this with a child. Say this. If a plus four equals nine, what's a? I say that's five. And then say if x equals zero and then x equals x plus one, what's x? You just damage that child. Manage it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm preparing you for the arguments that happen at the coffee shop. Um, I, I don't <coughs> There's the Haskell code. This is this will compile. Let me read it out to you. It says if the sum, so given a list, if that list is empty, return zero. Otherwise, there's the first element, there's the rest, return the first element plus the sum of the rest. And some people will say, doesn't that build up a stack? That's a really good question. It's a really good question because if you try this in, say, Python or Java even, yeah, and you pass in a list of 10,000 elements, it's going to build up a stack. It's going to be very slow. Might not, it might even do a little stack overflow. And say, no, you don't get an answer. All right? But in Haskell, that's not true. And that's simply because of the compiler. It's smart enough to optimize that. In Java, um, I haven't known Java really well, so sorry for that. This bias, but I'm sure it's true in other languages. If I write in my code three plus four, like literally three plus four, it gets compiled to seven at compile time. All right? Do you know that? It's a constant. If, if the compiler sees three plus four at compile time, it will substitute seven in, in the resulting bytecode. That's because plus is a function. Imagine if plus did counter equals counter plus one. Slip the counter equals counter. Imagine if it did that. And then the compiler did that substitution. It's a different program now, right? Count used to be counter equals It used to do counter plus one, but now it doesn't anymore. They're different programs. So because plus is a function, the compiler can do an optimization. And it can inline that value. Because plus, any expression that has like x plus y is always referentially transparent. Imagine if all the expressions were over. Imagine the optimizations we could do. Does that make sense? That's why that goes fast. Because Haskell just goes, yeah, it's Haskell. They're all functions. And it just optimizes the bejesus out of it. But yeah, if you try that in like Java, I have tried that in Java or in Python, yeah, you'll get a stack of overflow. So there's a trade-off to be made there. Don't run away and start doing it in Python or whatever. 
you've got to think about these things as well with those run times. What are the benefits? Who cares? I know how to have numbers in the list. Yours, just, yours is just fancy. <laughs> Give me my full lips back. Who cares? <clears throat> They're not always obvious, like that trivial example. It's probably not obvious. Both of them have numbers in the list, right? Such as that. Is there a point? It's really hard to make this point. Um, it's really hard because I can just keep giving you a trivial example and you'll just keep giving me back forward with counter argument and you're right. Um, it's when we start getting to the non-trivial examples where I, I could start sort of showing the point that. But just like I'll try to like um, not be too hand wavy, but try to give you a, like real good reasons. I can reason about <coughs> discrete programs and their subprograms. Whenever I see, you know, if you're reading like C tomorrow and you see A plus B, literally, you can reason about that locally. You don't have to look at the whole other program. You need to know what A and B are, and that's it. Plus function is not going to pull out your hard disk. Right? Well, it says in the spec that it's not. Anyway. But if it's like just some any function that I wrote, let's say, and you don't quite trust me, and I say, no, I put a comment at the top, this definitely only adds the two numbers. And, like, and then, you know, just kidding. Make a network connection call and whatever else I'm going to do. Right? You can't reason about these things locally. You have to trust the comment at the top, or you have to put it on the path until you, until you gain confidence. And hopefully don't mess up, don't slip up. I know that when I do it, um, my ability, like if you give me some C++ code or whatever, my ability to reason about those things, like I quickly exhaust my, my ability, I just can't do it in, in a non-trivial code base. Try and hold all the variables in, head, in my head and see which ones are updating when and so on. I really struggle. And we get something called composition of programs. So because, because we're all referentially transparent, like I can take the plus function, I can take the multiply function, I can use them together and make a new function. And neither of them are going to format my hard disk, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, like a non-trivial example, suppose we're writing a web app and we take in HTTP requests. Here's the HTTP request. Then we run a function on it and make the HTTP response and then we send it back. There's no I.O. here. All we did is take the data, do some stuff, I don't know, convert it to XML or whatever happens, JSON these days, right? And then spit it back out again. And I just make this a function, that whole processing of the data. I can reason about its parts locally, wherever I need to. I can reason about the whole thing, or some subpart. Okay? Um, I just don't know where the bottom of that hole is. Um, like, who cares? Um, I still don't know the answer. Um, all I know is my programs work better. So maybe you can find the bottom of the hole. I'll show you two programs. Who can see some code? Functions write file and read file so that I'm um, just talking here. I'll show you an example. This is like I think it's a slightly less trivial example, but still pretty trivial. So, what we do is we have a file here, and then we write to that file that string there, and then we read the file, assign it to x, print x, then write to the file that string there, read the file, call that y, and then we add up. Somehow I got string concatenation. But we see here that we have common sub expression, read file to file. And so, being the naive functional programmer, I'm just going to come along and I'm going to go right, break out to an expression, substitute. I'm going to assume everything's referentially transparent. Did the program just change? Sure did. X and Y are different. Well, X and Y are the same here. The same value, whereas previously, it would have read the file. 
Um, I guess the point of what I'm going to show you here is, um, yeah, it's, kind of, it's, it's a point that we kind of make on day three of the Data 61 course, but um, the point is, um, can I do this kind of thing in Haskell? With functional programming, with that stake in the ground, can I do it? And I just want to like show you the code. I want to show you the equivalent Haskell code, just so you can get a feel for it. I want to like, if you're a bit nervous about this like scary syntax called Haskell and whatever else, I just want to show you, show you, show it to you. There it is. That's the equivalent Haskell. <coughs> right. So let just means we've got a local binding, a, a local variable, which we had in the Python, right? We just said file equals file name. Write file, read file, and print. Write file again. Show just means um, convert to a string. Oh, I didn't add them up. Yeah, just print them out. And I have this common sub expression. I factored it out to a local binding, and then I substituted it. <coughs> I made the same program. He says, yes, be brave. I know you haven't seen Haskell very much before. That's OK. Yes, they're the same program. They will always do the same thing. And who says no? Be brave. No one thinks that they are not the same program. Everyone else is like, no, 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 what's going on? Is that right? OK, still. Cool. It's because I stuck the stake in the ground. I was very adamant that I wasn't going to move, right? All my expressions will always be referentially transparent. Yep, they're the same program. They are. The reason, um, I'll do my best to summarize the reason, is because read file. In the Python example, it returned back a string. So here's the file contents. It's a string, not in Haskell. Read file does not return a string. Intuitively, or at least um, some, uh, uh, an accurate model to think about it is, read file returns a program which, when interpreted, will give you access to the string. But it's not going to run it just yet. It's just going to go away and combine all these expressions together until you get a great big program. And you'll notice that that's not equals. That's a left arrow. That's an equals. That is substitutable. Whenever you see equals in Haskell, it's substitutable. If I said x equals 0, it's equal to 0. x and 0 are substitutable. But this x is not substitutable with this expression. In fact, if I pick up that expression and shove it right there, it won't compile. Because the x and read file don't have the same type. X is a string. Read file is not. The return value of read file is not. Um, some people say to me, how do I do imperative programming in Haskell? Like that. It's <coughs> imperative programming. Neatly. If you're looking for an adverb and you're demanding one of me, I'm just going to say, I don't know how they are responsibly. Like, like I don't know the correct adverb, but neatly, responsibly, just like that. That, that, that looks very much like um, C, would you agree? Or the Python code. It looks like do this, then this, then this, then this, but it's not actually that. Day three, let's cover exactly. Those of you who, who have done day three of the FD course, they know what that does. We pulled it all apart and put it back together again. Apologies, I can't um, summarize it better than that. But my slides go better than that. <coughs> <coughs> Sometimes it seems intractable, right? Like, consider, for example, if you're new to this sort of idea, and I just showed you some Haskell, and I just said, yeah, they're the same program. Like, I'm sure your mind's like, what? How can that be the case? That's fair. That's reasonable. It seems intractable. It seems like that can't possibly be true. And I, I, I sympathize with this position. Um, it is. It is true. Um, it just takes some time to realize why it's true. It seems intractable. If I said to you, go and write a, a web app with concurrent users and 
doing this on the database and all that stuff, sending JSON, and everyone sends that. It's, you know, I get it in my letterbox and wherever else I get it, it comes everywhere. And uh, it seems intractable if I ask you to write this program with that stake in the ground. It seems really hard, all right? My job, or part of my job, is to help you, everyone, the Australian software development industry, to overcome that, to learn how to do it, all right? So, so that um, as natural as forwards feel to you, I want these kinds of things to feel just as natural to you. Yep. Um, so you, if I'm understanding correctly, in the Haskell example, you're still invoking the function twice, is that right? Uh, you mean recall? Sorry? Do you mean the recall function? Yeah, so you, you're assigning it to an expression, and then are you still invoking it twice when you call the expression twice? So how is Yeah. So in this example, if you're doing the same thing in Python and calling it twice, why is this strictly faster? Well, it's not faster. Okay. It's just the same program. These two programs, P1 and P2, are the same program. <coughs> but with the example that you said, a reason to use Haskell is because it's faster, right? Uh, no. Um, look, sorry, let me clarify that then. Um, what I mean is that code that, that we wrote when we added up the numbers in the list, where it was recursive, if you were to do that in Python, then it would be very slow. But if you were to go and use a for loop in Python, then it would be very fast. So what, what I'm trying to say is, um, if you said to me, yep, I'm going to put that stake in the ground and always do this, and then go and use Python, and then you try to add up the numbers in a list, and then you did a recursive solution, <coughs> you're going to get a bang at the end because it's going to build up stack. So it's not, that, it's not like Haskell's always faster. Haskell is always faster in the recursive solution, just not in general, though. But I'm just cautioning you, right? I'm saying, um, not only do you have to commit to functional programming, but once you do, if you go and try it in Python, I don't want you to ring me up tomorrow and say, you promised me this was going to be good and I've got a stack overflow. Right? I don't want that to happen. Right? Because you will get a stack overflow. You, you're going to have to revert back to using a for loop or, or, or something. Yeah, I just want to, I'm just putting a, like, a caution there. You, you can't naively do it in Python. And many languages, actually. Yeah, does that make sense? Last question, I get it. Um, you know, I'll be lining up to get a copy and someone goes, you know, can't read my files in Haskell, but um, get it this morning. <laughs> what do you want me to say? You know? Oh yeah, you can't use Postgres. I'm gonna guess that. What do you want me to, you know? These are, these are commonly asked questions. Surely you can't do that. Um, there's a bit of a story behind this one. Um, someone, Someone got very, uh, how would you say, uh, very confident that you couldn't do that. And uh, so I wrote a library. So yeah, okay. yeah, there you go. Um, it's now used in production, but it was not the intention at all. It's used in a lot of places. I wrote it in Scala, actually. Um, because they, they said, yeah, we can't do it in Scala. I said, yeah, can. definitely can. It's just a different tool, um, a different way of thinking about solving the problem. Right. It's, there's no like, um, there's no law of the universe that says that I can't do it. It's just if you think about the solution that way, yeah, you can do it. That good answers. Um, my one of my jobs, one of my passions, actually, is communicating these answers to you. Um, I find it very challenging. If you you know you grab me outside later and said you know show me how to read a file and explain every single bit of it, we're going to be here a while. Um, but you know, it, it's, I find that challenging. I, I wish I could just like give you the answer, like just bang, there it is. <coughs> um, but uh, I have three principles in teaching, in, in communicating uh, these ideas. One of them is that you don't need a degree in this stuff. People say this to me, you know, you need, you need a maths degree to read Haskell. I don't have a maths degree. No. I want to make it so that you don't. You don't need expert knowledge, all right? I want you to feel satisfied. Whatever small thing I've communicated to you, small or big, I want you to feel like you're satisfied you've got a good answer to it. And the third thing is, 
that it's not wrong, but I don't tell you a lie. Who's heard of Monet tutorials? Someone's heard of Monet tutorials. So, sorry if you haven't, but who's heard of like Monet's our burritos and stuff? Monet's our burritos. You don't need a degree to understand what a burrito is, right? You feel satisfied. Burritos are good. They're great. But they're not burritos. Fails point three. For example, it's my job is to answer them all in full. All right. So that, that's why we run the FD course. The um, it's a three day course, introductory and applied. Um, it's free. I'm doing it in Melbourne in like I don't know two weeks or something. Basically, I, we sit down in a class like this, not in a lecture theatre, but a little bit more informal. And uh, we just go through small exercises, like you sum up the numbers in a list, and, and, and then do harder and harder things. And what else do we do? We write a parser, and uh, learn about functors and monads and applicatives, and then we did some I.O. just to finish off the day. So um, I thought I'd finish a bit early. And I, I, um, I had an assumption that there'd be some people in the room um, who wanted to learn something a little bit harder. All right? like, the problem is, is like, you know, I don't quite know the audience that well. You guys might know the basics, but not, and so on. So what I want to do now is ask you, do you have anything you really want to talk about? Because these are the things that I thought maybe you guys might want to talk about these things. Yeah? Can you explain to people how Haskell quickly clones a list? Quickly clones a list? When you want to make a new one, or like... Yeah, yeah. alright. <coughs> That's a good question, right? Um, well, let me rephrase the question back to you, and you tell me if this is related to your question. Surely if like lists are immutable, and we need to modify the lists, it slows down because it's constantly copying the list. Does, it, does that make sense as a question? Or is that not your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um. Two, three. The list is one, two, three. <clears throat> I've got two choices. 
I can either call nil or I can call comms. If I call nil, I don't give it anything. It takes nothing. I'm finished. That is not one, two, three. I guess I'm going to make the other choice. I am going to call comms. Here I am calling comms, but when I do call comms, I now have to give it the first element and then the rest of the list. Well, the first element is one. And now I have to give it the rest of the list. I have to make another list. I've got two choices. I can either call nil or I can call comms. I am going to call comms. Now I have to give the first element of that list. And then another list. I've got two choices. <laughs> You do this when you do your four work, right? <laughs> I've just made the list one, two, three. Now I can move that comp. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move, I can actually move that comms in the middle if I remove the parentheses. Just to show this is just syntax that I'm showing you now. And uh, comms. I can also remove all the parentheses now. And in fact, I can even write this. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, surely it's slow if I keep modifying these lists. All right, let x equal the list 1, cons 2, cons 3, cons n. I'm going to put 7 on the front. <coughs> that ran in constant time. Do you agree? <coughs> when I put an element on the front of the list, it's going to run in constant time. It doesn't matter if the list is infinite. There's 7 on the front. Right? So that ran in constant time. If I were to put an element on the end, that will run in linear time. We'll have to go all the way to the end of the list to put it on the end. We generally don't put elements on the end of lists. We don't do random access in lists. If you had to do random access in a list, I'll give you a use case. Like if you said something like, um, go and find the first even number in a list, and when you get there, move two elements back again and add one to that number that you're standing on. We would use something called a zipper for doing that. All right, we, we would, I wouldn't ask you to do that on a list. You can take a list, you can turn it into a zipper, do the zip operation, go back to a list, and then it'll all run in linear time. <coughs> right, but just simply putting elements on the front is constants, O1. Not only that, we've got sharing. So you can think of the list one, two, three just sits there. I can pass it anywhere in my program, I can put seven on the front of it, get a new list. The, the original list stays there. It never gets updated. <coughs> no one's coming sneaking along, putting taking the two out and putting twenty-two there. Because there's no updates. So we get sharing on the list. Okay. So yes, it will, it's true that if I um, try to put elements on the end, it's going to run in linear time. Who remembers the reverse exercise in, uh, in the Data 61 FP course? It's at the end of day one. It's a trap. It's a trap. It's what everyone's going to try and do. Let's try reverse like everyone tries. I'll talk you through the syntax. <coughs> I, I say to people, hey, reverse the list. Like, so imagine, you know, all from 9 o'clock in the morning, we've been adding up numbers in the list, we've been mapping and flattening all these things, and flattening lists, doing all these things, eating pizza, having a good old time, and I go, hey, reverse the list, it's like 4.30 p.m. And they're like, yeah, this is a great day. And, and then like, their, their program bombs. <laughs> Here's what they do. They say, if the list is empty, return the empty list. Right? And if the list, whoops, if the list has a first element, so H being the first element, and T being the rest of the list, right, so it's either empty or it's got a first element and then the rest. <coughs> you can use semicolons in Haskell too, by the way. Some people look at the syntax and go, that's so hard to read. So then I put braces and semicolons in and they go, there you go. <laughs> well, the reverse of 
given the first element and then the rest of the list, is the reverse of the rest of the list appended to the first element in a single element list. Does that make sense? So if the list is empty, so equals means um, then return this, right? So if the list is empty, then return the empty list. If it has the first element H and then the rest T, then reverse T and then append H in a single element list. And then append them. And I write this code and I go, ah, oh, it's a good day. And a great time when I understand this. <clears throat> and I say, hey, reverse one to fifty. One to fifty thousand, will ya? Oh no, when's this gonna finish? <laughs> the C programmers are laughing at us. <laughs> oh, look at those Haskell programmers. <coughs> Doesn't run in linear time, runs in quadratic time. Can you see? This running in quadratic time. First of all, this thing here is linear. Append, if I have to append two lists, it's going to run in time that's proportional to the length of the first list. And I'm doing that for n times. I have n times n. <coughs> we generally don't put things on the end of lists. Instead, I'll show you the code. It'll be hard for me to talk, talk through it. I'll show it to you anyway. <coughs> that will reverse a list in linear time. Oh, that's much faster. Ah, I'll probably finish today. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so it's just a different way to think about it. In order for me to get you to reverse a list successfully, I need to teach you new tools. I need to, I need to help you, you know, get these new tools on your tool belt so that you can do it. Any other questions? Is there, is there one framework out there for functional Say again. programming? Is there one framework out there for functional programming? Yeah, there are lots of them. Uh, Web frameworks. Yeah. Uh, the very first one uh, was called Yesod, Y-E-S-O-D. I was written in around like 2008, I didn't write it. Um, there's one, now today there's one called Snap, there's one called Servant. I think Servant's the one that most people use, or at least most people on my team use it. Um, there's one called Scotty. I don't do much web stuff, that's just, I'm sure there's probably more. Does anyone else know anyone? Yeah. yeah, there's quite a few. <coughs> so Servant is the one that I know the most about, because I was on my team user. I've used it actually. Yeah, I have to hack this thing together. So done. Yeah. Do you want to write it down? Or spell it out? Is that yeah. Okay? yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll write it. Yeah. I'll show it to you. Is it like, is, is it different than other? Is it different what? Like how is it less? <coughs> Different to the other ones. Yeah. Um, it does things like um, it does things like uh, uh, you know you get your routes like you know slash blah and whatever else. And if you uh, let me think now, I can't remember. It's something like um, if you get the route wrong. Like imagine you make a misspelling in your route, it won't compile. It does something fancy like that. But we're getting into the I don't know territory. It's something like that. It's probably over here. Um. <coughs> no, it'll be in the reading or something. Can't help me, sorry. Not much. I don't remember. It's just really easy. That's why I use the Linda. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. So if a monad is not a burrito, oh, what is it? <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> yeah. If the monad is not a burrito, what is it then? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I can, we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> what 
is uh, on Earth. Well, you know, what does it mean? That's what we'll say. What does it mean? Why do I care? <laughs> Let's just take the question and split it into two separate <coughs> ways. What does it mean? It means, um, rather than me answer what it means, I'm going to half answer it, and then I'll come back and fully answer it. Have you ever saw, have you ever written, imagine whatever language you're going to use tomorrow, imagine you're about to sort a list, <coughs> it turns out no one's written sort in your language. You're like, oh hey, they forgot sort. So you've got to write it now. Now what, is it, what language are you going to like, a type safe language? Java. Java, yeah. Oh, Java, they forgot to put sort in. Oh no, we've got to write sort. So you sit down to write sort, and you're going to sort a list of, I don't know, bananas. So you go, sort, right, we're going to sort our list of bananas. Does your type signature say banana? It does it? Oh, it'd be generic, I guess. Yeah, it would be, it'd be generic. That's right, it would say sort a list of anything. So that next time, I have to sort a list of oranges, I'm going to have to do this again. As long as the elements have ordering or comparable. All right, so you're going to say sort a list of anything as long as the anything are comparable. You'd write a common interface. Imagine they've forgotten the comparable bit. Oh no! Better write an interface. Okay, interface comparable, less than, equal, greater than. All right, now you're done. All right. Here's my half answer. It's an interface. So you don't have to write the same code over and over again. Alright? It, it literally is that. Why did we write the interface? Like, what's the like, what's it, in the In the software engineering class, we, we, we would say, hey, why did you write the comparable interface? And your answer is, so that I don't have to write sort over and over and over again. Right? Because if I didn't have the comparable interface, I'd go sort banana, sort oranges, sort buses, and we don't want to do that. We want an interface that abstracts over all things that have ordering so that I can sort a list of them. That's the exact same answer to line two. Why do I care? The answer is, so you don't have to write the same code over and over again. The problem in answering this question is, the sort example is like really easy. You're like, yeah, duh, of course I write comparable. Where if I showed you some code now, you'd be like, oh, they're all different bits of code. No, they're not. They're all the same good code. Let's see if I can do it off the top of my head. Here we go. Um, you had, say Java, right? No, let's not do that. Um, you have this. You have some function. You know what I'm going to cheat? Because I've written this down before. So given a list of something that has applied, 
and then a value x. Run through the list and apply, call apply with x and collect all the return values. Turn them off. Right? So I'm now going to make an argument, <coughs> which is this has this structure. <coughs> it has the structure. Given a list of things that take x to a, return a thing that takes x to a list of a. Does that like intuitively mean like I'm not telling lies? Is that cool? Alright. And this one here calculates all the Cartesian product of the list. So given a given a list, sorry, it's a list of lists. Given a list of lists, go through the, the list. And then for each list within there, go through that and add them all up. Take the Cartesian product. Uh, do an append at the end of return. So given that list of lists, produce that list of Cartesian product. I am now going to make the argument that this is of the structure that given a list of lists of A, return a list of lists of A. Okay, wouldn't it be nice, this is only three, by the way, I could show you a million of these, did you know? <clears throat> I'm going to make the claim that they are all the same bit of code. And if you ever <coughs> see someone doing this, and then the next one, and then the next one, the other million that I have in my pocket, you should tap them on the shoulder and say, why are you writing sort over and over again? I go, I'm not. I've got to do a forward, and I'm going to pass an argument here, and I'm going to do the Cartesian product. And no, no, they're all the same function. They are all the same function. They all have that structure, as long as that thing there is a mono. As long as it satisfies that interface. I'll call it for you. Let's call that function. Go to my thing, and I go, what was it? Was it oh, not no. So that function is called sequence. Type of sequence, that's what column T means. Type of sequence is, given a T of M of A, return an M of T of A. As long as M is mono and T is traversable, it's, it's not even lists, it's any traversable. All right? That means I should be able to pass in a list of possibly null values. Now here is a list where none of them are null, just means not null. And therefore, I should get back a not null list. There it is. Not null list. As soon as one of them is null, the whole thing is null. I'm going to call the exact same function again, sequence. What was the next one? Oh, yeah, list of functions. Plus one times. Well, these are the things that have applied. And I don't know. Um, I'm running out of imagination. There we go. There's my list of functions, and then the value to apply it to, <coughs> there it is. <coughs> I went through that list calling apply on 99. And the other one was a copy of product. There it is. Sequence is written once. We don't have to write sequence over and over again. If you see someone writing that for loop, and then that for loop, and that one, go, hey, why are you writing sequence over and over again? And I'm going to make a further, a bigger claim, which is if you truly understand the sequence, like if you just said, right, I want to understand the sequence, I'm going to go home and study all night, all, the, all weekend. You come to me next week and you go, hey, it looks like the whole industry is writing sequence. You're right. Hey, up. I believe that there's such a thing as the sequence industry. I've seen it. Is that idea? You've got teams of 200 programs that write sequence all day long. I go, no, that's different. This is a different code to this one. It's different. No, they're not. They're both sequence. Monad is the interface that abstracts it. So to finish off the definition, what is a monad? Now, I don't know how helpful it is in, in doing it, but I promised you I would. Where am I? Okay, there we are. 
in the third one I had. Now this is going to give you a really bad answer because it's going to show you more than you need. Um, but really all you need to do is look at this top one here and return. It's an interface, so class means like it has the class has the same job as an interface in Haskell. These are all abstract functions. This one is pronounced bind because it has a common name. It's the sticker on the back of my laptop. It's, you know, it's pretty common. We call it bind. And the <coughs> monad is anything, any m, m of a. So given an m of a, and then a function that takes an a to m of b, you can return an m of b. Can, can your m satisfy that interface? Not only that, given any a, can you make me an m of a for whatever m might be? And well, that's all the interface is. And there's a less footnote, a little bit more, but that's that's pretty much it. So if, if I just answer you, imagine I'm giving you this answer, which is just like, you know, what is a monad? What's that? Right? You go, well, who cares? And the answer is, I can abstract a lot of things now. There's a lot of things that make that happen. And uh, the job, my job actually, is to help you recognise them. Right? Like. This is just all fancy Haskell syntax and so on. You can't do anything with just that. You need to know how to take this as, as a model in your head and apply it. You need to know, okay, I just never want to write sequence ever again. How do I do that? You need to be able to recognize patterns so that you don't. Right? Like, there's someone out there writing sort over and over again. They're out there somewhere. I've, no, I've not found them. I'm pretty sure they're out there. But like, don't you feel compelled to like tap them on the shoulder and go, hey, <coughs> I care about you. I don't want you to do that for the rest of your life. There's other things. And you're like, go away, but I've got so many sorts to write. I've only done a million. I've got another million to go. It's, it's, this, it's a similar situation. There's a lot of things that need this pattern. So the practical answer is so we don't write the same code over and over again. Um, Nothing to do with burritos. You know, you know where the burrito comes from? A to M of A. It's like, oh, I have some ingredients, put it in the M, now it's a burrito. Like, how did that help? It doesn't help. <laughs> yeah? Do you have some automated pattern recognition tools that you use to actually go to the um, Haskell does, but not, not in the case that I just described. Um, I don't have a better answer other than training. I, really, I, I wish I had a better answer. I wish I could go into your brain tonight while you're asleep and just install a function fp.exe and then and just sneak on out. I, I don't have a better answer. Um, but Haskell does have some tools where, um, I'll, I'll give you an example actually. I'll, I'll, this is a trivial example. Um, uh, consider, like here is a function given x and y, so land, say backslash means lambda, given x and y, Turn x plus y, apply that to 88, and then <coughs> so apply this function, 88 to 99. Then you might say, surely there's a better way to write that. And yeah, there is. But what if you didn't know that way? What if you didn't know how to write it better? Well, it's even on the website. I have it installed, but you can go to this website called pointfree.io, and you can go, hey. It feels messy. Can you fix it? He goes, yeah, it's just plus. <laughs> uh, okay, plus. Uh -huh. Ah, thanks. There are a lot of tools like that. Yeah. Uh, here's another one. I'll show you another one. Oh, no. Uh, it only works on IRC. Uh, hang on. All right. Can you see that? <laughs> can't make that bigger. Imagine, um, I'll, I'll show you the goal. Imagine, and, and those, those of you who do the three-day FP course don't believe me at first. I say, hey, yeah, given the type, you already know the answer. Yeah, and that's surely not. Yeah, you do. And not only that, you can get the type, put it into the thing, and it'll just give you the answer. Right? If I said to you, I'll show you the type and I'll try to explain it. Actually, I'll do it this way. <coughs> right, here is a type and I'll explain this type to you. 
This says, so all the A, B, and C here are all generic. They're all probably more people with generic values. Okay, I'm thinking in my head. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'm thinking in my head of a function that takes as its first argument a function from B to C, so just anything that turns B's into C's. Then it takes a function from A to B. And then the whole thing returns a function that goes A to C. All right, so, so it takes two arguments. The first argument turns B's into C's. The second argument turns <coughs> A's into B's. And the return type is a thing that turns A's into C's. Yep. Am I thinking of anything else? Is there anything I could possibly be thinking of except for that thing? It glues the two functions together. Yeah, it can spawn out a thread. Just kidding, it's functional programming. <coughs> Right? Could return an null, just kidding, fantastic. <laughs> this is called a once inhabited type. There is only one program in this entire universe with that type. Right? If I beam this into outer space and the aliens pick it up, they go, yeah, it's functional position. There's only one function. Given that there's only one function, so I, got, I set this as an exercise, right? I, go, I say, yeah, it's once inhabited. Everyone's like, they just ignore me. Like, just once you have to get the type, give it to the machine and get the answer. Yeah. Do you think do you think I sit there and stare at it all day? No, I'm just cheap. There's the answer. Give me the answer. There's the answer. Oh, it's too small. But that's the answer. <laughs> that's the source code right there for that type. For example. Does that make sense? <coughs> so there's a lot of tools like that. But in terms of um, you know, how do I recognize how to not write sequence over and over again or whatever else, I can't come up with a better answer than just training. Like I'll sit down with you and like, let's just go for it. I've never come up with a better answer. I wish I could. It, it's similar to the question, um, <coughs> um, do you, have, you, do you, have you ever played chess? Do you remember the day you learned how a knight moves on a chessboard? Yeah? Do you remember the day you learned how a knight moves? This is what I did. I picked up the knife and I went like that. I had to physically move it. It was clumsy. It's like, what? Two, then one. I had, to, I had to do it again. Did it again. And then again, and now I have to do it in my head. You can probably do it in your head. It's like, yeah, it just moves over there, of course. And I got there by repetition and training. And I, I can't come up with a better answer than that. Do you think it's physically possible to have tools that can? Yes, I, I do. And they are in development here in Brisbane. Data 61. Yes. That's yes, I, I wish there were better tools for this. Like, I can show you Jim and I can show you all point free and I can show you these tools, but they're not going to help you um, overcome the thing that, that I'm getting at. Yeah. And, I, and there's no reason they shouldn't exist other than someone's not done it yet. We're in a good position to do it. Let's do it. So, yeah, doing it. I can never make me. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>